All right. So in the previous video, I covered just the basic uh, concepts and forces that create glomerular filtration rate. Now let's talk about how we regulate it and the importance of that. So again, uh, previous video, I covered the concept of urine formation and, uh, the, the, and the, the importance of it. Uh, talked about, uh, the, I shouldn't say talked about, I should say reviewed the basic structure of the glomerulus and how that contributes to the filtration of blood in the glomerular in the capillaries of the kidneys that we refer to as the glomeruli or glomerulus for singular um, and then also I mean factors that create uh, GFR the hydrostatic pressures oncotic pressures and so on and in this particular video we're going to talk about the mechan some basic mechanisms that are used to regulate GFR all right and this it's very important that you understand these mechanisms and the concept of why because Glomerular filtration rate is something that we don't really want to mess with uh, because if it gets too high or too low, that will cause some severe issues. Because remember, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned in the previous video, and I'll mention again now, um, the kidneys are often described as as their main function being the formation of urine. But the real thing you need to think about with kidneys is that is why do we form urine? Remember, kidneys are basically maintaining a constancy of extracellular fluid. We circulate blood into the kidneys. Remember, blood is in constant contact with extracellular fluid all the time. And blood is constantly removing waste products. And when I say waste, the waste I'm referring to are specifically are like actual organic waste, like, like metabolic acids and other molecules that need to be eliminated from the body. And the only way to really do that is by adding them to water and excreting them from the body via urine, and it's the kidneys that do that. Plus, the kidneys also remove materials that are just found in excess in extracellular fluid, like sodium and potassium and other electrolytes, vitamins, uh, minerals, and so on. Um, the kidneys can also be used to retain uh, materials if they, or I should say solutes, if they're too low. Again, like sodium, potassium, uh, other minerals, and so on. All right, so basically these mechanisms of the kidneys are very important to maintain an overall extracellular fluid con constancy of um, our extracellular fluids, um, or as I have here, a concentration constancy. Now remember that, that the force of glomerular filtration ultimately influences the second major step of urine formation, reabsorption and secretion, because remember... Um, when blood is filtered uh, via the, uh, through out of the glomeruli, um, we tend to overfilter blood. We tend to remove materials from blood that we don't want to actually remove from the body. However, that's a good thing because remember, overfiltering blood allows us to maximize our removal of those waste products that are unwanted in the system. All right, but since we do over, since we do overfilter blood, we it's imp it's imperative that we reabsorb that useful material back into the system. All right, and then there, and and then initially we don't filter out all of the waste right away. And that's why the secretion of waste out of paratubular capillaries back you know, into these renal tubules is very important. All right. And remember that if GFR gets, remember I talked about this in the previous video, I'll just kind of uh, run through this again now. But remember, if the glomerular filtration rate is too high, then we'll send tubular fluid throughout the nephron too quickly. And then the highly absorptive membranes won't have enough time to pump and reabsorb those materials back into the bloodstream. All right, if GFR is too low, we'll over reabsorb, uh, we'll, we'll put wanted materials back into the blood, but we'll also have too much time for absorption and we'll start putting waste products right back into the blood. So that's obviously kind of a counterproductive thing. So it's very important that we keep GFR, remember, at a constant rate of 10 millimeters of mercury. That allows tubular fluid to flow through the nephron just fast enough to where we don't reabsorb waste. Or I shouldn't say not completely, but where we minimize the reabsorption of waste back into the blood, but just slow enough to where those pumps can 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 bump can come in contact or bump into useful substances and put them back into the bloodstream. All right. Now there's two major forms of mechanisms uh, uh, in terms of regulating GFR. There's intrinsic and extrinsic controls when we're dealing with GFR. Remember, intrinsic is just another word for, ex I'm sorry, intrinsic is a word for internal, extrinsic is just a word for external. 
Now, the kidneys are very, very good at self-regulating glomerular filtration rate. They have a, they have a good system of, um, they, they just have a good system of internal mechanisms to keep this in check. And there are also external mechanisms that help us, especially under extreme circumstances, to keep our glomerular filtration rate uh, normal, all right? Now, these, we'll talk about, I'm not really going to go over these in, in exact order here, um, but basically, uh, the two major self-regulating or intrinsic mechanisms are the myogenic mechanism and the anatomy of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. The juxtaglomerular apparatus, juxtaglomerular apparatus, that's a fun word to say, um, is it's an anatomic structure located within nearby the renal, well, which is which is part of the renal corpuscle essentially, um, but the cells that can that 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 that, that comprise of the of the JGA, uh, the abbreviation for juxtaglomerular apparatus, um, play a very critical role in influencing glomerular filtration rate. And this is what we would, if we say self-regulation, the proper term for this obviously is auto-regulation. Auto meaning cell. All right. And then there's some extrinsic factors such as the sympathetic nervous system and uh, various chemicals. Uh, well, nitric oxide is more intrinsic, I should say, um, but the, but chemicals that are very important in regulating GFR as well. So the first major mechanism I want to talk about is the myogenic mechanism. Now, you could read some books and some of the literature out there, and they'll talk about the myogenic mechanism, but they'll say that it, it's a little controversial because some people argue that it doesn't that this doesn't have a large, as big of a contributing factor to GFR as people might say it does, but most anatomy textbooks out there talk about it like it does, so I'm going to do the same as well, because like I said, this is, you know, this these lectures are designed for, uh, you know, just regular anatomy physiology courses, so... Um, so let's, let's break down this term, myogenic. Myo, you know, means muscle. Genic means to create. Okay. So, so basically, this is a mechanism that is essentially created by smooth muscle. And remember, smooth muscle is found in the walls of hollow organs. And well, what do you know? We've got two hollow organs right here that enter and exit the glomerulus. Uh, the afferent and efferent arterioles. Remember that the afferent arterial is um, larger than the efferent arterial, but by design that's really important because that increases the, 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 the volume and filling pressure of the glomerulus, thus increasing filtration rates. And, you, and then you add the narrow diameter of the efferent arterial, that creates a slight resistance to the flow of blood out keeping blood in the glomerulus for a little bit longer, increasing filtration. All right. However, I mean, so you can probably think then, uh, you know, if there are changes in blood pressure, for example, if we see changes in systolic blood pressure um, in, our, in, our, in our peripheral, uh, you know, in our peripheral vascular system, you can, you can probably think that that should probably have some influence on this. I mean, think about it. Remember, systolic pressure, the pumping pressure of the, the, the pressure that's created by the pumping forces of the heart, essentially, if we have an increase in systolic pressure, that should cause an increase in glomerular filtration rate because, remember, increased pressure will cause an increase in flow, and that should cause us to engorge our capillaries or glomeruli even more. Um, but, however, the afferent arterial, um, the, the muscular wall of the afferent arterial is sensitive to that because, basically, if we do have an increase in systolic pressure, that will cause the walls of the afferent arterial to stretch, causing the muscle tissue to stretch. And as a result, that will essentially cause the um, that will the, the response out of that. You're going to see constriction of the. I'm going to abbreviate this: the afferent arterial (AA). If we have an increase in systolic pressure, now again, that should make sense. If we constrict this vessel, if we constrict the afferent arterial, that means there's less blood filling the glomerulus, less blood is getting it, less blood is being filtered, we're creating a little less tubular fluid, thus making sure we're maintaining that constancy that we keep talking about. And if the afferent arterial constricts, the efferent is going to dilate in response. All right. Um, 
and then it's just you just go in reverse. If if systolic pressure drops too low, then that will cause the afferent arterial to dilate and the afferent to constrict, increase our filling pressure, um, increase resistance to flow. Again, trying to maintain that constancy of 10 millimeters of mercury. Now, this mechanism would obviously be proportional to the changes um, in systolic blood pressure. The higher pressure is going to get, the more the afferent would constrict and the afferent would dilate and vice versa if pressure drops too low. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind, though, is that this mechanism is kind of obsolete if we start, if we dip below 80 millimeters of mercury or if we start to rise above about 180 millimeters of mercury. All right, then this, this mechanism, like I said, becomes fairly obsolete, and then we have to rely on other mechanisms to keep our blood pressure in check here. Now, let's, just, let's, let's kind of take a step back here and think about this for a second. Remember that we essentially cycle about 180 liters of fluid throughout the kidneys per day, all right? And we reabsorb about 98.5 to 99% of those fluids that we filter out of blood right back into blood and also the electrolyte composition. So that leads to about an average urine output of, of about 1 to 1.5 liters per day, which is about right. All right. Let's say we were let's say we didn't have this intrinsic mechanism here or, the, or any of these intrinsic mechanisms and let's say let's say we just increased our our filtration rate by 25%. Okay? that would cause an increase that that means we would go from sending 180 liters of fluid through the kidneys per day that would cause that to rise to about 225 liters per day and if we still kept those absorptive mechanisms at you know 99 98 percent that would cause our urine output to increase from about one liter a day to about 46 liters per day or 46 and a half liters per day now picture that for a second we only have about three liters of plasma in our system to work with in terms of sending fluids through the through the uh, glomeruli, filtering them out, sending them through the tubules, and reabsorbing them back into the blood. If our urine output, if our output increased to 46 liters a day, that would be so much to the point where we would actually be completely depleted of plasma. All right. We would be, and, and as a result, we wouldn't be able to clear out our extracellular, you know, the, we wouldn't be able to maintain that constancy of our extracellular fluids. All right, we would deplete ourselves essentially of extracellular fluid very quickly. All right, so that's why it's important that we main, that we stay within, the, that we very, very tightly stay at that 10 millimeters of mercury, because even just the most minor changes, as you can see, cause dramatic effects. All right, um... I mean, 40, if you think about that, a urine output of 46 liters a day, I mean, we only have about a little more than 60 liters of water total in the human body. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty significant. All right. So that essentially is the myogenic mechanism. Pretty, it's a pretty straightforward mechanism. An increase in systolic pressure causes constriction of the afferent arterial, dilation of the efferent. A decrease in systolic pressure causes dilation of the afferent arterial, constriction of the efferent arterial. That's fun. Next, this is more of an extrinsic form of control. Extrinsic form of control. Remember, these the SNS stands for sympathetic nervous system, which is a functional division of the autonomic nervous system, or the ANS, um, which is a which is a, a which is basically what we call the visceromotor division of the peripheral nervous system. If you want to be technical. Um, now, um, now basically, uh, basically what we have here then is, now remember if you think about the structure of the autonomic nervous system, um, basically remember it has two functional divisions, the parasympathetic nervous system, PSNS, and the sympathetic nervous system, SNS. Now, most organs that are innervated by the autonomic nervous system um, are, are undergo the concept called dual innervation, where they're innervated by both or fibers from both of these systems. However, blood vessels are different because blood vessels are only innervated by sympathetic nerve fibers. All right. Um, and the afferent arterial is no exception here. So the afferent arterial is fairly heavily innervated by sympathetic nerve fibers. 
Now, if we increase, now this goes with any vessel in the body, if we increase sympathetic outflow, as an old professor of mine used to say, or what that really means, if you increase the amount of impulses or the rate of impulses from the sympathetic nervous system to blood vessels, that will cause them to constrict, okay? If we reduce the amount of sympathetic flow to a vessel, that will cause it to dilate, okay? Now, in order, now basically, it takes a pretty a pretty extreme situation to make the to really make this these effects dramatic. Um, for example, I mean strenuous exercise. Yes, we you, we know that the sympathetic nervous system basically is what prepares us for the fight or flight response. And remember, fight or flight. You know, the a, a situation where you either have to fight or run your way out of. And remember, during that response, we have a significant redistribution of blood flow. From our from our visceral organs to our to the skeletal muscles in our limbs, so you can fight or run. You know, like like the age old joke: you're walking through the woods, you encounter a bear, you just have to outrun whoever you're walking through the woods with. Um, but um, uh, so it takes a pretty so so it would take a pretty a pretty significant um, stressor to to cause that much sympathetic outflow to these afferent that cause them to constrict a lot. Now, also in situations of extreme stress, this remember, sympathetic nerve fibers directly innervate the adrenal medulla. And remember, what's secreted from the adrenal medulla? Catecholamines, which is the fancy word for adrenaline, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And, that, and, and these hormones also are vasoconstrictors. All right. Now, in, in 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 but that takes a pretty extreme stressor to do that, like a bodily injury. Um, uh, you actually do run into a bear in the woods. Uh, you know, uh, a, a car accident, something like that. Now, the problem here is if we increase the amount of catecholamines in the system. Now, what remember? Remember a, a significant functional difference between the nervous and endocrine system. Effects of the nervous system are very short-term and rapid. You know, we send an impulse out, create a minor change, and create a quick change in an organ, and then we stop sending impulses out, that change is reversed. All right. Whereas with hormones, we have to, in order, you know, hormones create cumulative effects by a buildup of hormones in the system. All right. And, there, and, and, the, and the thing is here, those cumulative effects take longer to reduce because we have to clear the hormones out. So even though the effects are a little slower, they do become more generalized and enhanced and cumulative because of the vast amount of hormones that create them in the first place. Now, you hear stories about people, like, for example, someone, let's say there's a car accident, a car is on top of somebody, you hear about a person lifting a car up, you know, performing some superhuman feat, all right, which is, I mean, which is a, I mean, a cool thing to hear about, but the problem is, is obviously that's a situation where someone pumped out lots of adrenaline. And what'll happen is now this, this isn't something that happens overnight. It'll take a week or two, but what'll happen is with those high amounts of catecholamines in the system, they will stay in the system for a while, and that could cause the afferent arterial to stay so constricted for so long that that will reduce the amount of blood flow into the glomerulus, you know, almost you know, kind of semi-chronically, and as a result, that reduces the amount of tubular fluid created. And remember that these absorptive cells, I mean, they need oxygen. And if we're not sending enough you know, blood and fluid into here, that's going to be problematic. And you know what happens to any cell that's deprived of oxygen for too long. And you have to remember, nephrons are not replaced. When they die, they die. All right. So you hear about these people performing these super these superhuman feats, but at the same time, it could be at a cost of they could have severe kidney damage. Um, you know, I, I was just, I, I just talked to somebody the other day who was, who had a severe accident with a car. They were working on a car. The car literally fell on them while they were underneath it. And the person was able to get the car off, but obviously had very, very severe injury. That's a fairly traumatic event to have, uh, or to experience, I should say. And the, while that person was in the hospital, that person actually had some kidney issues due to the fact that there was just so much adrenaline in, in the person's system that that there was just not enough blood flow, but due to the fact the person, you know, the, but the person was in the hospital for a while, obviously due to the severe injuries of the car falling on the person, 
Um, and as a result, they were able to manage the, you know, they were able to manage the, the, the kidney issues until the catecholamine finally went, uh, you know, the, the amount of catecholamines in the system went down. And luckily, that person did not have any severe long-term kidney damage. All right. But, um, but that's something that's very common in situations like that. So in a nutshell, basically severe stress um, where we have increased sympathetic outflow or catecholamine release will cause the um, afferent arterial to constrict um, and basically reduce the amount of blood flow into the kidneys, uh, the, therefore decreasing glomerular filtration rate. And again, that's important because if you think about a situation like exercise, you would want your GFR to go down anyway because if you're in a situation like exercise, why would you want to create more urine while your blood pressure is higher? That means you're going to lose more fluid. That's going to make your blood pressure go down, and that's going to be a mess. All right. <laughs> so that's how we neurologically that's, – that's probably one of the more major ways we neurologically regulate this. Um, now, before I talk about the uh, – what, what I've been referring to as the JGA or the juxta glomerular apparatus. Let's review the basic structure of the nephron here for a second. So the beginning of the nephron, remember, is the renal corpuscle and then extending from the renal, which, which consists of the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule, and then extending from the renal corpuscle is the first major tubule of the nephron that we call the proximal convoluted tubule. And then the proximal convoluted tubule will eventually descend down into the renal medulla, uh, you know, the renal pyramids, and form what's called the thick and thin, uh, I'm sorry, descending loops, the actual loop of Henle itself, and then the, the thin and thick ascending loops. And, and, cumul and, and cumulatively, we call all of this the nephron loop. All right. Um, and then as the nephron loop extends back up into the cortex, it then forms another convoluted tubule called the distal convoluted tubule. And the very early part of the distal convoluted tubule basically passes right by these afferent and efferent arterioles and forms a structure called the juxta glomerular apparatus. Remember, juxta, nearby, on top of, close, close to, juxta glomerular, next to the glomeruli. So it's an apparatus of cells that's near the glomerulus, all right, which you can see here. Now, the juxtaglomerular apparatus, um, this, is a, this is a highly specialized form of intrinsic control. Uh, obviously, we're talking about in the kin kidneys here. So, the, so this here, again, is intrinsic, all right, intrinsic control. Excuse me. Now, basically... Within this juxtaglomerular apparatus, we've got cells that are called, uh, kind of around these arterioles that are called, uh, I'm just going to abbreviate this, juxtaglomerular cells. All right. One moment. Sorry about that. Um, we've got juxtaglomerular cells. Um, and then... Basically, what we have here within this uh, within this this part of the loop of Henle that passes by the the nephron here, we've got a group uh, a specialized group of cells that are referred to as um, the macula densa. The macula densa. All right, and then these cells here these are these are also just juxta glomerular cells here, as as well. All right. Now, the, the, the really important part here is the macula densa. The macula densa basically mo monitors what we refer to as the salinity or the salt concentration of tubular fluid. The macula densa is very sensitive to changes in sodium chloride levels uh, of the... Um, excuse me, of the, uh, of the tubular fluid. I mean, wherever sodium goes, chloride tends to follow it around. Chloride is one of the more abundant uh, extracellular anions of the body. And like, as I just mentioned, it, it has a tendency to, again, follow around um, uh, sodium. So, um, so now basically what we have here is if we have to rewind back to this basic concept of GFR, glomerular filtration rate. Remember, if, if GFR is too high, we will send 
tubular fluid through the, through the tubules of the nephron way too quickly. And if we're sending that fluid through here too quickly, then that means there won't be enough time for, the, for these absorptive membranes that line the, the, nef the tubules of the nephron to reabsorb useful materials back into the blood. All right, and, e and even though these paratubular capillaries will be secreting material, you know, uh, unfiltered waste into here, it'll just, this will just be moving by way too fast to collect it properly. All right, so it's very important, again, that we keep that GFR at a rate of 10 millimeters of mercury. Excuse me. All right, now. So think about this then. What would happen to the salt concentration of tubular fluid if glomerular filtration rate was too high? I want you to think about that for a second. What would happen if it was too high? Would that cause the salt concentration of tubular fluid to be too low or too high? The correct answer is they would be too high. Because remember, if the filtration rate is too high and we're sending tubular fluid to the nephron way too rapidly, that's going to cause these electrolytes to accumulate. And the problem is, is if we're not reabsorbing these electrolytes back into the salts, back into the blood, that will cause water, you know, more water to accumulate inside of the tubular fluid, and we're going to have a higher urine output, and we're going to lose more electrolytes. You add that up, that's bad news. So, um, so, so, so then what will happen, you know, how this works is still blah, not well studied or under, I shouldn't say, it's just not well understood. Uh, but basically what we do know is the juxtaglomerular apparatus will cause the afferent arterial to constrict, all right? What it'll do is it'll release, it'll release chemicals, you know, these juxtaglomerular cells will release chemicals, plus it's also been found that cells of the macula densa are loaded with Golgi at the organelle, the, you know, the Golgi apparatus or Golgi complex, and you know that cells that contain Golgi, you know, endoplasmic reticulum, rough ER, and Golgi are highly secretory cells. They secrete a lot of materials. So they, so they secrete some kind of chemicals, and that's what's not well understood, is what are the exact chemicals that are secreted. Um, but one of the things that, 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 that's been studied, and one of the things they, they've kind of been finding, is they think that, those, that these chemicals may have something to do with decreasing the amount of nitric oxide uh, in, the walls of these, or in the walls of the afferent arterial. So think about this for a second. So, what, so nitric oxide is a... It not only does it make you laugh and feel funny, in blood vessels, nitric oxide is a vasodilator. Okay, it's a vasodilator. It causes the, the, the muscular, smooth muscle walls of vessels to relax, causing them to dilate. Now, logically, this should make perfect sense because if glomerular filtration rate is too high and we reduce the amount of nitric oxide in the walls of the afferent arterial, that will cause the muscle to become more tense and cause the afferent arterial to constrict. And that means we lower the filling pressure of the glomerular capillaries and we lower the filtration rate of those capillaries. All right. And we would obviously lower that proportional to the, to the volume of uh, sodium that would be found in uh, in the tubular fluid, just like the myogenic mechanism, everything is proportional. the 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 amount of constriction that's going to occur is going to be proportional to the changes in in, in pressure uh, that are occurring. All right. So if glomerular filtration rate is too high, you will see constriction of the afferent arterial and a reduction in glomerular filtration rate, which allows again for enough time for us to reabsorb just the right amount of sodium and chloride will follow it back into the bloodstream. We don't reabsorb 100% of the sodium that, that is filtered out, but we want to get as much of it back into the blood as we can because it is the most abundant extracellular fluid cation, which plays a critical role in osmotic and membrane potential, osmotic forces and membrane potential in the human body. Breathe. Okay. Um, so that's, what, so that's a, a consequence, of, a kind of a chemical consequence of GFR being too high. And the opposite would happen if GFR were too low. 
All right. So, and there's a, and there's a variety of ways glomerular filtration rate can get too low. If um, systemic blood pressure were to drop for a variety of reasons, for example, um, if somebody was hemorrhaging, if somebody was bleeding, uh, they're going to be. You know that if somebody's bleeding, they're losing blood volume. That's going to cause blood pressure to drop. Plus. If they're bleeding, they're also losing the composition of blood as well, the electrolytes. So that means not only will pressure drop just due to a lack of volume, there won't be enough electrolytes to filter out into here as well, which will cause the electrolytes of the tube composition of tubular fluid to drop. If someone has if someone has severe vomiting going on, you know, if they're vomiting, that's material that never made it to the small intestine to be absorbed in the first place, and as a result. You know, when you vomit, you lose a lot of water and you lose a lot of electrolytes. If someone has severe diarrhea, all right, diarrhea is just when you don't absorb enough water back into the bloodstream and you lose it and you lose a lot of electrolytes with it, all right? Um, so, uh, so basically, all of those are going to cause a reduction in blood pressure and also a drop in basically the composition that was awful handwriting, but you get what I'm saying. They're, they're going to cause a drop in the electrolyte composition of blood and extracellular fluids as well. As a result, that's going to cause GFR to drop. Now, that's that might sound goofy. So, so basically what I'm going to talk about then is a mechanism basically to increase GFR a little bit. Now, that might sound goofy because if we're losing blood, we're losing fluids, why would we want to do that? Well, if glomerular filtration rate got dangerously low due to a drop in blood volume, remember, these absorptive cells need oxygen. They need, so we need to increase GFR proportionally just enough to keep basically the, these, these absorptive cells, the nephron, alive. All right. But obviously not so much to the point to where we're actually losing more fluids via urine as well. So what will happen then is these, these cells, you know, these macula densa and juxtaglomerular cells, are the primary storage sites for the enzyme that we and the enzyme renin. Renin is not a hormone, renin is an enzyme. Okay, renin is an enzyme that creates this small cascade of chemical re reactions that that inevitably creates the formation of a hormone that's called angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2. Angiotensin II is a very potent vasoconstrictor. I'm just gonna. That's it's a it's a it's a vasoconstrictor. Angiotensin II especially targets the efferent arterial, which causes the efferent arterial to constrict. So if we have increased renin in the in the blood, we will have an increase in the amount of angiotensin II which causes the efferent arterial to constrict. And, and as a result, if, that, if this constricts, this will also cause the afferent arterial to dilate even more. All right. So if, we, so if this constricts, this will dilate. And as a result, that will cause an increase in glomerular filtration rate. And that will cause us to basically send more tubular fluid into the nephron, keeping basically keeping these cells alive and functional. And also that will prevent us from reabsorbing waste back into the bloodstream. And one of the ways we get around this increase in GFR as well is angiotensin II also causes an increase in the amount of antidiuretic hormone in the system. Now that's nice because the receptors for ADH are on the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts of the nephron. So what will happen is we'll keep glomerular filtration rate high enough so we can reabsorb sodium and chloride and other useful materials back into the blood. You know, we'll, we'll try to keep it at 10 millimeters of mercury, which, again, remember, that's slow enough to where we reabsorb useful materials back into the blood, but high enough to where we keep waste. And it's kind of ingenious, then, if you think about this. Well, then, if we increase our ADH levels, that then will cause the distal convoluted tubule to dump more water back into the blood, thus allowing us to conserve water. But at the same time, we're also eliminating the waste from the body via urine. It's kind of a, it's kind of a nifty little trick if you think about it.
And then angiotensin 2 also causes an increase in thirst, and that should make sense as to how that will increase your volume, your blood volume as well, um, by consuming more water. Now, one thing to keep in mind about these chemical messages or these chemical reactions um, or messaging systems of the juxtacomitor apparatus, they're slow. All right, these, 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 these pressure response mechanisms that create the myogenic mechanism are much more rapid and much more quick. And then if things get pretty extreme, again, where we're seeing significant loss in fluid, where we have to activate the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system, um, like I said, that will cause us to, you know, again, that's caused when GFR goes down, all right, which will cause a drop in the salinity or salt concentration of tubular fluid, which will in turn cause the activation of the renin-angiotensin system. Which, which in turn causes us to increase capillary filtration rate and it will still allow us to eliminate waste properly. But then by the increase in antidiuretic hormone, that'll help us return a lot of that water back into the system. Like I said, it's realistically speaking, biologically, it's an ingenious mechanism. So, so those are the major ways we regulate capillary filtration rate. And again, like I said, the important thing to take away from this is that we use these mechanisms to keep glomerular filtration rate at about 10 millimeters of mercury so we can properly remove waste from the body and at the same time reabsorb useful materials back into the blood. All right, so that is the, so those are the major mechanisms of how we regulate glomerular filtration rate. And basically I'm kind of done talking now about um, the first step of urine formation, uh, uh, glomerular filtration. Now the next thing to think about then will be what I call the, um, the good Lord, brain fart. What I like to call the processing of tubular fluid reabsorption and secretion. So there's going to be a lot of cellular mechanisms to cover there. I, you know, again, I'm not going crazy in depth with them, but you know, I will give you the stuff you need to know for again a regular undergraduate AMP class. But um, but next we will move into um, uh, reabsorption and secretion.